what's missing curfew. It's when you kind of play guilty, but you show up. How nice is a green light on the road, though? No practice tomorrow, no playing, just go. Scotty Upshaw in the clear, and he scores! One in front, scores! A few laughs, a little bit of fun, and obviously a lot of hockey talk. You're listening to Missing Curfew. With our lads. Up dog, my man, fell a Friday. And what's happening, Obes? Hey, buddy, it was nice to tee it up with you there yesterday, huh? Yeah, it was good. I'll tell you what, that Newport Beach Country Club is ready. We got the Hogue Classic coming to town. Uh, I got P.A. Pronto coming in for it, actually. Nice. The Flying French. The Flying French, yeah. He's, uh, he's coming out. I wonder if he's hot as he was there in Aspen when he came out for that hockey game. I thought he was flying. The last time he came to Newport Beach, I remember, I think Mackell was out was living out here at the time. And I think I texted all you boys. I said, there's a, there's a, there's a crazy Frenchman on the loose in Corona Del Mar. I mean, he came out of the gates just hot. So... I told him this time, I go, listen, this was probably three years ago. And he agrees. I'm like, we, we can't come out of the gates like we did. Or we're going to just ruin our whole trip, right? Like, let's just play some golf, have some dinners. And then maybe we go maybe we go big on the Saturday night. You know what I mean? I wonder if he's, uh, is he ready for all the kooks? Going to be walking down the fairways there at the Hogue? Or they'll be chasing Freddie around. Oh, yeah, they love Freddie. Not Fred Funk either. Freddie Couples. Baby. Boom, boom. Huh? He could play, is he going to play? He didn't play last year because of a bad back. Yeah, I hope well, he's all right. I mean, he's all right. Uh, great course. The course in great shape. Um, Taylor made the new the new driver. I, I got it with Casey. Uh, you know more than anyone that the driver is not my best club in the bag. For you fellas out there that are looking to uh, treat yourself this upcoming golf season, I loved it. Ups. I know maybe it's the old honeymoon phase, but I thought it was unbelievable. The QI ten. I like the blue. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't love. I didn't love the stealth too, but this one, first time hitting it, I love it. So if the boys are out there and want to treat themselves. I mean, I know you don't have to worry about it because you're bombing whatever fucking driver you're using. But I like that. I had some fairways yesterday. Yeah, no, I, I got the driver in the bag. Shout out to Casey, our boy. Um, listen, the driver is nice. It's sexy. It's black. I, I think if you ask anyone uh, in the TaylorMade family, probably players players alike, they were pretty upset that they didn't go from the Stealth 1 into just something completely new. Like, why back it up with Stealth 2? It's not a bad name. It's, it's just not a fresh name. It's not a fresh look. It's the same fucking club. Yeah. It just wasn't, it didn't give the spunk that it needed. But this new one, I you got to have the spunk. Yeah, new spunk. You got to have the spunk. spunk. So, no, the way you were hitting your driver yesterday, I, I loved it. Um, yeah. You know, we took on the boys at, uh, shout out to our boy Mike Close, Silky Silky. Uh, we, we just took down the boys. It was a nice, uh, well, nice we, way to spend it. They had us on the front nine. And then uh, RB, Ryan, I don't want to butcher his last name. I'm, I'm I butcher everyone's name on this podcast, so I won't butcher his, but he had a girl on the front nine that we pressed him on the back and, and we just got it going. I text Silky after the round. I said, hey, thanks for having us. Course in great shape. Uh, if those boys are asking what happened on the back nine, you just tell them they got upshot because that's exactly what happened. Hey, just tickle on the front. Hey, 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 hey. Boom, press. For our smoking. listeners out there, you know, I've been in Aspen two weeks. I'm fucking Vegas before that. So Scottsdale before that. It's been a while since we played. Since we're Richie, Richie Babe there at Scottsdale yeah. National. That's and that was a bloodbath. I know. Yeah, that was a bloodbath. I got to give some love to Danny Lane, former uh, baseball player in the Montreal Expos organization. By the way, there's a documentary coming out on Netflix about what happened to the Expos. No shit. Yeah. Is there some crime bosses involved? Is there maybe the French mafia? There? There's got to be something involved there. Yeah. But, I mean, we were young. That was, what was the lockout? 94, they had the strike, but the Expos were the best team in baseball. And then we all know what happened after that. They Thirty shit. for thirty, or what? It's a Netflix. Maybe you're, nice. I think your boy Silverman might have been oh. might be producing it. Oh, it's an untold. I think it's an untold. Wow. Yeah, that'd be juicy. Yeah. A uh, shout out to Betty. Fuck, he was flying this weekend at Kygo. Was he? Oh yeah. We got to get to. Uh, we got to get to Montreal. I think for that President's Cup in September. Yeah. President's Cup and maybe F one. Is that when that? That's F one's uh, in June. Man, I, that's I, where the flying Frenchman should take us out. I've had some fumbles, but I remember after my. First or second year in Tampa, Vinny's like, hey, Opes, come into Montreal. This is why, see, I was dating this girl at the time. I just, you know, like the old, like if you go on yeah. the trip, you know you're going to come back to just fucking pure misery. Anyways, he's like, Opes, come in. I got this place dialed. Let's fucking rock and roll. And I never went. Yeah. Imagine going that far with Vinny LeCavier back in the day. Uh, anywhere with Vinny LeCavier back in the day. That look, that it's a fucking six foot six, fucking just yeah. a monster. Good looking. Rich. Stud. 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 Um, Listen up, dog. Uh, Newport Beach is great. Looking forward to the whole. Well, let's talk a little live tour real quick here. Anthony Kim is back wearing the girl dad t-shirt. Thought of you. Yeah, I thought it was a great tee. Unbelievable. Sauce tea. hockey. Let's go. Um, it was great. Pat Perez, who I think is an absolute beauty, who I actually saw Perez during F1 in Vegas. He was in the high limit lounge at, at the Bellagio. 
and I kind of wanted to go over, right? Because I, I love Pat Perez, but I didn't want to be that guy, right? He's chilled there with his buddies and in the, uh, what's it called, Privé? In the Privé, yeah. Privé. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't want to go over and bug him, but he's sitting there drinking, gambling, having a good time. But he's like, hey, thanks for dressing. He goes to Kim, he's like, thanks for dressing up. Thanks for dressing. He had like a t-shirt <laughs> and these like shitty shorts on with I mean, sick high tops. Just good to be back. Yeah. They got to be pumped for him to be back. I think so. It's going to bring more eyes on it. And, you know, whether he was in rehab for a back or a knee or a nose, well, who knows what the, what the hell. It's nice that Kim's back. He did say, I'll t- he goes, I will tell my story. Yeah. I, it's not, not this week. I'm here Focus to beat on some masses, but. Focus on goal. Maybe you talk to Benny Silverman about getting Anthony Kim on tool. Yeah. I remember him down the stretch at the, the Masters I went to in 2009, and it was just epic. He showed up on the back nine just f- flying. Um, yeah. And that was at probably his peak. And then there was a downfall, but it's nice to see a guy with a with a good story coming back. And Live Tour is buzzing right now. You know, you've been enjoying right. watching Live Tour, yeah? I love it. I know, they're playing cool. uh, Saudi Arabia this week, and then I think they're in Hong Kong next week or something. Or maybe the, the next week's not Hong Kong because I think Steeler might be playing like an Asian tour event or something. But Big E, we're going to play in that, uh, Shady next week with Big E and Loops. Yeah, I heard that. I just got the text yeah. today. I'm like, Loops. Shady, eh? We should maybe get Loops. How are the greens? Are they a little, a little stiff there? Or? We should maybe buy Loops some golf balls. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't played in uh, forever, eh? He's going to just go out there. Well, and it's us to... first then, then. Yeah, he's going to try to manufacture it around there. I remember the Ryder Cup. Do you remember back in the day? It was in Kentucky. Uh, Paul Azinger was a captain. Boo Weekly was on the team. Remember Boo Weekly doing the doing the Happy Gilmore off the tee? That's the last thing I remember of Anthony Kim being on that team. Wow. After that, I don't remember. Like, well, do you remember why he left? Injuries or yeah, no, his injuries. Yeah, injuries. Yeah, and rehab, rehab. Yeah, he was sure. showing up to the course like hung titty. He was just yeah. I think he just wanted to you know fix himself, step away from the game, and he couldn't get healthy. You know, there was a health thing, but then I think it was. You know, when you battle when you battle injuries, it's tough, man. It's tough, the mental grind of it and the physical grind. And I think forever he just, I think he took his insurance money and just really wasn't able to kind of find the groove again. And yeah. it was long-term. It's crazy how many people, like we, we see it now, and we've talked about this video off the air about how many guys are going into the NHLPA protocol now, right, for, for help, getting help mentally or with, uh, you know, drinking too much or whatever it is. It just makes me think back to when we were playing. Like, there was probably so many guys that were dealing with shit that we never even knew, eh? Yeah, but I I think it's, like, social media and shit. I think it's guys not being able to get off their phones for the most part. And then, like, dealing with, you know, the trolls on online or, you know, watching your girlfriend fucking travel around to Turkey with a bunch of rich guys on a boat. You know, And then she jumps out of a closet like a goddamn magic show. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's, really there's, there's a whole lot of things that probably go into, to, you know, into factor here. You know, it's Christ. So what happens when you take the early flight home from San Diego? She jumps there in your closet like a goddamn magic show. What my friend's trying to say here is love is blind. True love is blind. Sorry, I'm not a talker. I was just saying like I got a, a lot magic of guys were show. battling with, yeah, yeah, magic show. But a lot of guys battling with, with stuff. Yeah. Now looking back when we played, right, it was the old school mentality of suck it up and well, fuck it. yeah, Is starting he... from the top down. Yeah, I mean, from from the moment you got to the rink to the moment you left, it was sandpaper skin. You had to have, yeah. you know, mental, you know, toughness was part of being a pro hockey. Now, now, but I, I think there's so many factors to it all. There could be something in the Gatorade bottles, or fucking, you know, the, yeah, or or just <laughs> the way you're brought up. You know, the, yeah. the way that the new last 10 year generation has been brought up or, you know, the fact that you never went on a fucking 10 game goal drought before in your life, yeah. you know, and before we just, you know, you had to deal with that. Yeah. Otherwise now you're like looking games, though, now. You, yeah. Now you're looking online and you're just fucking strolling through cause yeah. you're, you know, cause you hate hockey. So yeah. now you're looking at chicks and fucking Mykonos. <laughs> you're jealous, <laughs> you know, I think there's gotta be like, I, I think. In our era, it was too far the other way. Like, I, I think about guys and, like, I was a good teammate, but at times I was hard on some of my teammates too, right? Like, if they weren't playing the right way and I'd be hard on them in practice, I'd think back, yeah. who knows what he was dealing with. Like, Cole Wilson, for example. Remember Willie? Yeah, of course. Willie was a rookie I that I was so hard on and, like, that I thought there was more, like, I wasn't taking it serious enough. And, you know, he was too arrogant as a rookie and I would play him hard in practice. And I would, and then I look back and it's like, wow, this kid was dealing with stuff that I had no idea. Of course. And now you, I think it's too far the other way where these some of these guys are so soft that if something goes wrong, you know, they blame, you know, oh, I've got some, you know, this and that, whatever. I, I just think there could be a more of a happy medium, so to speak. But it's, yeah. it's crazy how many guys are going into the NHLPA program now that need help. It's like, it's it's really well, eye to me, I guess. I think at the end of the day, what we need to look at is is hopefully that 
you know, the, the help they can get, no matter if it's, if it's truly, truly necessary, or even it's on just a simple spectrum of it, that they get help and that nothing ever happens, you know, in, in what we dealt with. Some of our yeah. teammates we lost, which yeah. is crazy I know. and, and head injuries and all that stuff. And it all plays a factor. But at the end of the day, you know, if we can keep guys, you know, alive and we can keep, you know, mental health a non-issue because they can step away for a couple weeks, a month, whatever the case may be. Yeah. If it's fixing a drug problem, if it's fixing uh, a, a problem at home with the family, if it's abusive problem, whatever the case may be, there is there is outlets for it. But you know, most important, it's keeping people, you know, alive so they come home to their family and their kids every day, and that's the most important. Hundred percent, well said. And it's like nice to know that for these guys now that if they got to go get help, they're not going to lose their job, right? Like for me, who is you know at the high com- at the height of my career, I was maybe a f- number four defenseman on a on a you know probably a bad team, but I was a five six guy. Like, it's nice to know if I would have needed to get help back, then I could come back and my job would still be there. Like I was worried about you know Nolan Baumgartner or someone else coming up and taking my yeah. job, and I'm like, not that I was dealing with you know my 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 the way I dealt with it was win or lose, hit the booze, right? That's why you know I had to let. Some that's steam- why you made a t-shirt. Yeah, but that's why I let steam off the way I did. Like that's how I dealt with it. I got up the next day and I moved on. That's that's how I dealt with it. Yeah. I right? try to get laid. Try to get practice and, and move on, but I, it's, yeah. I guess it's good that these guys can get help and not worry about hey, all oh, this guy from the America is going to come up and take my job. Kind no, of thing, right? no, and I think there's you know you have teammates now that feel you know close enough to you or you know as a leader or maybe not just as a buddy it's saying hey like pull a guy aside yeah you know fuck buddy I see you just kind of changed is everything good mixing you know? the water. Yeah, well, you're, <laughs> hey, you're drunk again at, at practice. There's some vice you know, over no, there, but we all dealt with it. We've all had teammates, and we all have best friends that we've either you know lost due to this, or we've saw go down a bad path, and you pull them back in, and you know they're better people for it. You're a better person for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's different. It's, Do you think guys are different. still using the Vicks vapor rub to try to fool the coaches, or what? Do you think that's still being in the... um, halls? I used to just rub it on my chest, right, here. right under your ball sack. Yeah, halls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're like, hey, no, bud, you're supposed to just rub it on your on your chest, not your balls, because yeah. now you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, now, now she's really leaking. But uh, no, up dog. Seriously, it's, it's great what the NHLP is doing for these guys. Uh, last but not least, here in the intro, nobody loves Dana White more than me. I love Dana White. I love this guy. If I was American and had a vote and he ran for president, I would vote for Dana White for president. However, this year, last year in 2023, the UFC made $1.3 billion in revenue. Next year, they're projected after signing this deal with the WWE to make $2.3 billion in revenue. It's time to bump up these bonuses. They've been $50,000 for since I've been a UFC fan. Dana, let's get them up to one hundred k, right? I mean, I, I just think it's time that these guys should make... A little bit more. I think Dana takes great care of them away from the octagon with health care, training, uh, mental health that we're just talking about with hockey players now. I think the UFC is goes ab- above and beyond for their fighters. But, I mean, yeah. listen, you know, Brandon Moreno was a headliner in UFC la- last week in Mexico City. I think he made, you know, 200, 300 grand. It's like, back. Now you got to make more than that. Yeah. No, these guys are modern-day fucking, you know, gladiators. They, they truly are. The training, um, you know, the pain. Uh, the the the, tra- the travel the fight you know it's uh, the entertainment the the whole thing the product of what he what he's built now he is the you know he is the owner endeavor and you know all these you know the the backing now and the partnerships they built um you know there's a lot of money at stake but you're right like top fight of the night yeah give him a hundred million bucks <laughs> hey there you go top fight of the night you know how fucking crazy those fights would be if, yeah. if it was a million bucks oh night? that's true I, I was gonna say a hundred grand because he gives like think he, of it. he gives like fight of the night performance of the night i mean if they threw an extra million bucks those guys would be going they would harder. go to town yeah you know they yeah. might kill each other but i know <laughs> dana i just think 100k up dog thinks give the boys a million give Fuck them a what they would be going toe to toe i know what a product it would be try yeah. it one time try it once a month though the big fucking fight maybe like, ufc 306 at the sphere Maybe Dana you know, like gives out a million bucks. Best fight of the fight night, it's a night. million bucks. Fight best knockout, night. 250, you know, yeah. right? I love it. Dana, I love you, buddy. But uh, I like to see those bonuses get up a little bit. We'll be right back here at Missing Curfew. <laughs> Welcome back to Missing Curfew. Up dog, my man. Get this guy, Labat Blue. Presented by Labat Blue Light, the pristine Pilsner. Enjoy your beers together so you can live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly, fellas. Beer, Labat USA in Buffalo, New York. Ooh, tasty, tasty, tasty read. <laughs> Sounds of summer coming up soon. Baby. Up dog, start dishing some Labatt Blues around, fella. Oh, where to start? Where to start? How about this guy? 
The guy with no jibs living up in T.O. in the, what is it, the 416? Uh, it is the 416. There we go. The Five six, points in three games now, boys. Tyler Batuzzi, has got 27 points on the season. He had a hattie. What a road trip they had, by the way. What a road trip. Kidding. I think he scored his 100th goal. Uh, this guy has been buzzing. So, Tyler Bertuzzi, fucking crack open a nice cold Labatt Blue, would you, fella? Yeah, let me jump in there before you move on to your next guy. Um, Yeah, finally Bertuzzi is starting to play to the guy that they thought he would be. But yeah. what a road trip. I know. They go in, they kick the shit out of Vegas. Totally. And then I'm thinking, okay, they're going in, uh, they're going in, they're going out, sorry, after the game in Vegas, right? They're going out, they have to go out. They have won six straight. The next day, they got to fly to Colorado. The tin air, I'm thinking, my lock of the night, they come out and beat the Avalanche. He, like, for me, that was such a statement win for the Leafs, and Bertuzzi was a big part. So, up dog. Yeah. You're right. But for that guy, just to blue. follow on it, they rode this wave of fucking Matthews scoring his 50, 51 in Phoenix, in his hometown. I mean, the team was buzzing. You got to think they. How many kills you know, were they getting? I uh, totally. But remember, remember when they were opening waters and spraying waters on Marner and all that shit? Like, that's not what the fucking Lightning do. That's not no. what the Bruins are going to do. It's not what the Vegas Golden Knights are doing. They're fucking spraying beers. They're spraying the <laughs> Blues. But this trip, they ought to have been spraying each other with fucking whatever. There was a lot of shit being sprayed. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff getting yeah. sprayed around. I'm sure. No, so. So listen, they rode that wave of, of AM34 getting his 50, 51, you and then Bertuzzi's saying, buzzing. You keep saying riding that wave. It reminds me of the release from Pearl Jam. Yeah, Where it takes, Mary. By the way, big guy, thanks for the tickets. We yeah, got some tickets at the, that, at the The form. OG Newport crew is going to night one at the form. I would tell all those boys to call in sick the next day. It's a Tuesday night, too, so we got no pod the Tuesday. next day. Yeah, Ooh. it's just like, let's go. Tuesdays. Go. Um, Love it. Go ahead. And, uh, well, why not? While we're handing him out, fella, how about this guy down south in Florida? Sam Bennett, 14 goals now in the season, 15 apples. This guy, just a fucking wrecking machine. 49 games, he gets 77 pims. Yeah, I love to me, he is a staple Paul Maurice fucking two-way forward that has been a force since he got there from Calgary. Listen, yeah. no one expected him to do what he's doing. Uh, what a player. I'd love to be on this fucking guy's line. Yeah, you would have. I would have loved to play at this. You guys would have been great together. Yeah. Yeah. Good you would feel that, Thanks, you, Actually, you could, you could, this line that they got right now, it, it, it could have been Kachuk, Bennett, Upshaw. It's Cousins. And listen, Cousins was, cause he was good Belleville boy. I, lo I love Nick's Cousins. Listen, if I played against him, I'd want to kill him. Yeah. He was a little upset with the updog, which, by the yeah. way, started to trend. Updog was the first guy that kind of called him out. Then Bieksa called him out in Hockey Night in Canada. Then Biz Nasty called him out on Chicklets. I was like, it's coming from all angles. Well, well, I mean, because I've been there. Fuck yeah, you yeah. got hit this no, guy fucking late, but you, you know, flop. you know, but what I'm saying, you didn't flop around. Like but that. you you hit this guy late. You you pretend you're not going to see a guy come. They're fucking coming. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like they're coming. You just know. Like when I hit a guy late. I fucking know the guy's coming. You, you can't just like pretend to not know. So anyway, when I say I've been put in that situation, when you fucking run a guy, get your stick up, get it fucking ready. Get They're coming up. It's still hockey. And by the way, since Revo said what he said, we can't use the works because we can't use the works because someone owns some of real. We almost got sued for the first time here at Mister <laughs> Curfew over a T-shirt for Revo. But ever since Revo said his little bit in Toronto, the fights. Well, Matt Rempe, we talked about him this week, but. Fights are up. There's another great fight last night. Cooley from the Rangers just dropped his shit, started chucking. Yeah, I saw that. That's great. It's great. great. Uh, listen, Uppy, this line of Bennett, Kachuk, and Cousins is unbelievable. It's playoff ready. That is going to be a big line for the Florida Panthers, which I believe right now is the best team in the National Hockey League. Plus 850 to win. What are they? Plus 850. Ah, oh, that's a good bet. Yeah. Throw some money on nine, them. I already got my one. money on them. Nine to one. Yeah. Get, get in there. Uh, let's stay right there in South Florida with the good vitamin D. My boy, Monty Kid Fala. Brandon Montour back. He's fucking buzzing, man. Yeah. He is absolutely buzzing. Like, back up the bridge truck to Monty's house yeah. right is now. Is he a free agent? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beep, Heads up. Beep, 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 beep. Listen, he had a golden apple against the Sabres. He was the best defenseman, maybe the best player on the ice. Uh, five goals, 17 assists, and 43 points. He got off to a slow start. You know, I was coming back from injury. But he is absolutely buzzing. Monty Kidfella, you're fun to watch. Keep it going. Get him a Labatt Blue. And then let's go back up to the Northwest, JT Miller. I mean, this kid's shorthanded goal the other night uh, against the Pittsburgh Penguins was unbelievable. He was all over the ice. They ended up losing OT, which fucked up my parlay oh, cafe yeah, up dog. Or two. But this guy is everywhere. JT Miller, get yourself a Labatt Blue for that shorthanded goal, fella. I will say this. Talks, I love you. The way they played against Pittsburgh... Loose, man. 
Loose. And you know talks had money on the board, too. Loose. Yeah. Talks, right? The whole coaching staff played there. I know. Watch our talks. Foot? No. No, foot didn't. No, foot didn't. But fucking foot battle. What's that other coach they have on there? Is it Brad Yo? Mike Yo. Did he? Was he a pitcher? Mike Yo. He started there under uh, under that fucking that son of a bitch. Terry. Oh, I hated that guy. Terry. Huh? Yeah. So he was he was Terry. He couldn't have been coach. a good guy. He couldn't have been a good guy. Michael Terry. Yeah, Michelle Terry. Michael, yeah, of course. I'm Michelle. Michelle Terry. Um, no, I can't imagine can't the imagine. stories you hear. He's not not perfect, but. And they didn't win when they got, but when they fired him and brought Bowsman and they won. Disco Dan Bowsman. Disco Dan. Naked, naked headstands through the dressing room in Cincinnati with DUX spray painted on his chest before Let's the games. Go. Ducks hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, Ducks hockey. I'm like, this is fucking great. I'm 40 years old. Now. Uh, that was the uh, Get This Guy Labat Blue Up Dog. It's milk cart time here at Missing Curfew. Listen, I love this team. I love Clayton Keller. I love Lawson Krause. I love the big tune, O'Brien. I love what uh, Swish and Heat Daddy are doing at Boots on the Ground with Bald Arena. But one thing about missing curfew is we're honest here, good yeah. or bad. And they've lost 13 straight. So, boys, uh, hopefully this gives, it gives you a little bump on the milk carton. But the Arizona Coyotes are on the milk carton. It doesn't get any easier up, dog. They are heading into Toronto tonight. They are minus 250. I already have taken the, the Maple Leafs. I'm disappointed. I had, I had higher hopes for this team up. So I didn't think they would be you know in a, a skit of 13 straight. All I would say to this is, it's time <laughs> to sell this fucking team. Yeah. And let's just maybe Ryan Smith's the guy. Bring him right into fucking into uh, Salt Lake City and have him buzzing next year. Because with a new jersey, new rink, new town, I'm over it. I'm new fucking, girl. I'm over it. New, new girlfriend. Pen. New bullpen. Get a new girlfriend. Nothing. <laughs> um, Nothing like what going. better place than the Salt Lake with a great owner to go play next year? What, what are they thinking? Let's go. It's time. Yeah, I, I already say it. Uh, when you got traded or signed to a new team, or did you look at it as, oh, my, I'm leaving a good bullpen and I got to restock? Or were you excited to just try to get a new bullpen? New bullpen. Yeah. Yeah, it's a free agency frenzy. Yeah. It was just, you know. Coming into a city. Oh, let's be honest. Nobody so really you, knows who you are. Especially you're under 30. Oh. It's yeah. like, come on. Huh? Oh, good I flow. Mean, remember my first Talk year? You already got 100 tucks. You're just ready to rock. Oh, right? yeah. Come on. You're the new guy in town. Yeah, it's great. It, it's great. So, boys in the desert, get it sorted out here. I still can't believe we haven't been to the mullet, but we still haven't been to the mullet. I hope we never go there. I don't think we're going. At this rate, we're not. It's time. Yeah. It's time. Salt Lake City, Ryan Smith, lots of money, deep pockets. Why not? Guy was young, yeah, good-looking good guy. Town. Ski hill 45 minutes away. Tons of golf. Yeah. No, oh. it's, it'd be great. It'd be great. So that was Milk Carton. Uh, get it going, boys. Hopefully that gets the Coyotes going out in the desert. Good luck tonight heading to Toronto. Maybe take the over in that one, too. Maybe take the over. Yeah. Around the National League here, up dog. Uh, Chris Tanev, shout out to Dave Penyota, Fourth Period Magazine. Chris Tanev is off the board. Um, I had an argument with the scout about that he was going to get a first rounder for Tanev. I, I, I never thought they would. I thought this is a good trade for Connie. Second second rounder, uh, Russian defenseman pros, prospect, and a third round pick for Tanev. I think that's yeah. a good trade. Yeah, no, I listened to Connie's interview. It was basically... You know, do you want to get a first round pick? You don't know who it is. Right now they get a second rounder and a guy they know. And they like this kid. I, I personally don't know shit about him. Gruznikov. <laughs> I, I don't either. You know, I'm sure either. we're butchering his name, but um, you know, they retain what, fifty percent of his salary. The devils pick up twenty five percent of his salary. Maybe that's a sign that, you know, they're gonna do something in the works. You know, can can the Devils work something to get a goalie? Is Markstrom at all in the talks? Like, but but the fact Listen. that the fact that they came in and retained you know twenty five percent of the salary and might say something for the near future. If the Devils can get, I, I watch the Devils play. I know it's the San Jose Sharks, but your boy Jack Hughes was absolutely he had on a string the other night, like on an absolute string. But the pace to their game. Timo Meyer looked good. I know he's going back in against his old old team, but I, I just watched him play, and I'm like, if you put Markstrom in between the pipes for the Devils, look out. Look yeah. out. Like They might not be a bad future bet. Yeah. I mean, Jack Hughes, buddy, he looked unbelievable. The back end for the Stars, Harley, Hiskinen, Lindell, um, Hakapa, yep. Suter, yep. and now Tanev. Listen, I haven't watched Dallas play a whole lot. Uh, that's a good back end. Listen, I, I'm pulling for them as well. I would love to see Jamie Benn win one, Pavalski win one, Sags win one. Um, it's a good trade. They're going to be a tough out-up dog. And for Craig Conroy, he's doing his thing in Calgary. 
while they're still trying to make a push for the playoffs. You know what I mean? It's got to mm-hmm. be a tough thing for cons, right? Like we're still in it, but I guess you got to look at like we're not going to win the Stanley Cup even if we get in, right? No, the, the I mean they beat the Oilers last week, but I know, good luck getting through Vancouver or Edmonton, right? Yeah, good luck. I mean it's impossible. And just staying here in South Florida, we were talking about Monty and Bennett. Listen, man, Paul Maurice and Sylvain Lefebvre, who was my favorite D coach ever, and uh, honestly kind of fucked me when he left. He left. I signed a three-year deal with the Colorado. He, he leaves to go be the head coach of the Hamilton Bulldogs. I remember calling him being like, what are you doing, man? He's like, oh, I want to be a head coach. I'm like, well, you want to go back and ride the bus? Like, yeah. fuck. Yeah, crazy. Great coach. The Florida Panthers, the reason I love them, they're so good defensively. They've given up. You know, three or less or goals or two less goals in the last certain amount of games. They're back end. Listen, you talked about dog days and playing in places. Kulikov and Ekman Larson have gone to South Florida and rejuvenated their career. Yeah. Cooley looks like the defenseman he was when you were there. I know. And He's Ekman back Larson. living in his house in Boca. That's yeah. Why. Right? That's yeah, something to be said. It's, like, it's totally. Something to be said here. I know. To be bringing these guys in where they, they want to be. And Bobrovsky's tracking the puck like I've never seen anyone up dog. And if they play that good defensively, I mean, look out. Yeah. We might be heading back to the Grove with Gretz and fucking hanging out for vitals. So. Yeah, that was a great trip. Yeah. Mess. We could get our chance to get our money back. Washi's going back uh, uh, March 21st, he told me, because I was going to see if you could get PA on a rim. He's like, I'm going back to the Grove to play with uh, 99 and MJ. Nice. I said, take him down, Washi. Yeah, yeah. Take MJ down, fella. Good for him. He could dream. He is deep. I just want to be like Mike. <laughs> uh, DraftKings, baby. Presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours, fellas. Listen, we could put DraftKings on the milk carton. There was no fucking game, no top titty last week. No So top listen, titty. we apologize. Top titty's back. Get in there. Thousand US dollars up for grabs. First place is a buttery tea and a hat. Up dog, my man. Princey's got some value guys here. Money kid, we gave him a little bat blue. $5,600. Uh, averaging 13 top titty points. Haggle the bagel, 5,500, which 5,500 is, is middle of the pack. Yep. Right? The big boys are 10 grand. 5,500, averaging 11 points, has 21 points in 14 games. That's good. Lucas Raymond, 4,500. And Tyler Bertuzzi, a guy who you gave a Labatt Blue to at 3,800. So keep that in mind. Get in there, stare at the salary cap, and try to take the fellas on, eh? I bet, I bet. Yeah, ride the hot hand, baby. Ride that hot hand. And then, uh, you know what? Just figure out a way to just buzz, you know? Buzz. Yeah, get the boys buzzing. Speaking of buzzing, it's the a, it's a Saturday night lock of the night up, dog. I lost a fucking heartbreaker last last Saturday. The Leafs beat the Avs. Up dog's back on the winning ways. Listen, I'm one and four in my last five on, on my lock of the night. I'm nine and six. Up dog is nine and four. I lost Uppy, so I'm going to go first here, fella. I looked at this earlier, and I thought I already had Yeah, right there. I got to do it. I'm going to take the Dallas Stars at home against the San Jose Sharks. It's going to be like minus three plus, but I got to do it up, dog. I need a win. I got the Dallas Stars at home against the poor San Jose Sharks. Ooh. Woo. Okay. I am going to take the Philadelphia Flyers at home oh, nice. against the Ottawa Senators. Good bet. Fly, guys. Fly, baby. Fly. Fucking Flyers. Great bet up, dog. That would be a good game to watch. Two cents play hard. Yeah. They play hard in Philly. They ain't going anywhere. I know. I know. I, Philly's right there. I'm really interested to see uh, what Philly does at the deadline. If you're Danny B and Jonesy, what do you do? Because you want to you want to reward your guys with, hey, we no one picked us to be here. But they also have a plan, right? So you don't want to give up on the plan. No, 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 for sure. But you want to reward these guys like, fuck. Yeah, I think ownership's happy to get a little, like a little run. Maybe make the second round, a couple extra million bucks. Yeah. And a couple more little Farragon, little, little shoes, playoffs, and little Tom shares. Ford suits for the owners. Yeah. DraftKings, baybee I got the Stars against the Sharks, and Updog's got his former squad, the Philadelphia Flyers, against our boy Brady and the Sens. Listen, fellow Friday coming up, here's Jay Feaster, uh, a guy that was great to me throughout my career, Updog. Uh, a, a guy that I, I love and respect a lot. And uh, it's a good interview coming at you here. A Stanley Cup champ. Yeah. You know John interview. Torter very well. So this is this is a fun one. Up dog, my man. 
uh, we are business partners now, right? Yeah. We're, we're trying to run this missing curfew thing, but we had many of bosses throughout our day playing hockey. And yeah, we have. Some good ones, some bad ones. Uh, this guy <laughs> was one that, that meant a lot to me, and uh, I wanted to get him on for a long time. So, up, dog, I'm happy he's here. Calder Cup champion, Stanley Cup champion, an all-time good guy, Jay Feaster. How you doing, buddy? I'm uh, just great. It'll be great to be with you guys. Yeah. Hey, I, I see you're in your office there. I, I was in your office a couple times, but listen, we, <laughs> we always had pretty good conversations, especially in Tampa when I came in and saw you. Yes. Yes, we did. Absolutely. You, you were obviously, you were one of my favorite players. I traded for you twice. <laughs> I know you did. Uh, we right, gotta, no matter where I went. We got to get into that, Jay. <laughs> I don't know what, what was over your eyes there. but uh, you Well, know. Scotty, I'm not saying that cost me my career. But <laughs> you notice I'm not managing no. anymore. So. You know what, Jay? I often think about that. Right? Yeah. I'm like, I, geez, I hope I wasn't the one that was the final straw for I don't Jay. know what's crazier. You, you bringing him in twice or me being his business partner now for four <laughs> years going on. <laughs> hey, Jay, I well, want to ask you real quick before we get into it. Was this guy ever on your radar? Because he seems like he was your type. Type of player did it up dog? Oh ever? yeah, yeah. Well, oh for sure, Ab absolutely through the years, yeah for sure. Yeah. Yep, and and it was a case where you know, as you know, you, you make the phone calls and you ask the questions, but it takes two to get a deal done, and so absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jay, let, let's go back to when when you first got to Tampa. We obviously know you know you won a Stanley Cup there. Coop and the boys have have won two after you've been there, but but take me back to when you first got to Tampa, an assistant GM role. What was it like? How much different is it? How, how happy are you with the way you've seen it grow? It, it's incredible. I, I started uh, in the 98-99 season, came here directly from Hershey, and Jacques Demers at that point was the, the head coach and general manager. The owner was Art Williams. He just fired Phil Esposito as GM, and his brother Tony was the AGM. And, and Jacques brought me in as his assistant GM. And uh, you know, thinking about where it's gone from there, within within less than a year of joining the team in that season, Art Williams was selling Mr. Davidson, Bill Davidson, out of Detroit, the owner of the Detroit Pistons, uh, the old Detroit Vipers of the IHL. He he bought the team at that time. Rick Dudley came in as the assistant GM, I or as the GM. I stayed on as the assistant GM. And, and then in the middle of the old 102 season is when uh, Duds parted ways with the team and I was named the general manager. So to see where we were back then and to see where it is now, I mean, I thought it was crazy after we won in 0304, but to see how this community has become a hockey town, uh, it really is. Uh, it's very rewarding, very satisfying, and, and it's just it's a pretty cool thing. Jay, bring me back to like that, you know, so 99, 2000. Yeah, I was part of the National Predators at an early age where, you know, we were four or five years into, you know, an inaugural season in the NHL. And, and you know, I look at David Poyle and what he's done with not only providing like winning hockey on the ice, but providing like the culture in and around the city to the young kids and to the hockey programs. How important was it for you guys back then to make sure, you know, Tampa Bay understood just how special hockey was and then trying to put a good product out on the ice, like to mix those two together. You know what, Scotty, I'll be honest with you. It, it was back then, it was truly, uh, it was like triage, right? We, we were trying to save the patient, meaning the NHL team. Uh, I mean, it was a money losing venture. It, yeah. it certainly was for poor Art Williams. It was a money losing venture. You know, Art came in, bought the team from the Japanese ownership group. And the first thing he did was clean up all the outstanding debt. I mean, we, you know, we were a team that at the time used to have to check into a hotel and pay cash because <laughs> the credit was so good. I mean, literally, yeah, it was wow. bad. And Art, Art cleaned all that up. And, and even when Mr. Davidson bought the team, I remember when I was GM, Ron Campbell was our team president. And, and we used to go up to Auburn Hills, which is where Mr. Davidson's business is, the, you know, the, the flat glass business was located. And, and we'd go in there, we'd meet, and we'd have some niceties, and he'd talk a little bit about the team. And, and you know, I'd give him what I thought we were going to look like and what we were trying to do. And then he'd turn around Campbell, and he always called him Soup, right? Campbell, Campbell Soup. Yeah. He, he'd say, Soup, I don't want to have to write a check this year for more than $15 million. Do you think you can keep the losses under $15 million? <laughs> and he was serious. Yeah, wow. <laughs> we, we'd leave the meeting. And Ron Campbell looked at me and go, well, 
here's what we're going to do in revenue. So figure out what your payroll is going to be this year. <laughs> I mean, literally. So back then, we weren't doing the things that we needed to be doing within the community. And I can tell you that it was when I came back in 2010, after I'd been there in 2014, I'd gone to Calgary in 2010, came back here in 14. And at that point in time, I was brought in to run the community hockey department. And, and that's when we realized under, under our new owner, owner Jeff Vinnick, that we need to, we need to start building the, the, the affinity in the community. And, and that's really when that started. And it's been gangbusters ever since. Yeah, I mean, minor hockey has grown so much in Tampa. I mean, the city in general is booming, but the Lightning have been a big part of hockey. But So, Jay, you go from assistant GM to, 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 to you're the man, Duds, who I love Rick Dudley. He played my uncle, I think. He's an old school guy. But, but yeah. talk about it. You're, you're the GM of the team. Um, were you ready right away? Were, were you nervous? Like, How was it making that big jump where all of a sudden you're the man? Yeah, it's it's different for sure. And, and it was certainly, you know, the guy who really pushed for me was Ron Campbell. Uh, you know, I, I remember Tom Wilson, who was the, the CEO out of Detroit, who was basically Bill Davidson's right hand man. I, I, I know that it wasn't an easy sell for Ron. Ron. Ron told him, I have the right guy. Jay's the right guy. And, and I know that that wasn't an easy sell. The, the great part of it was that, you know, the organization, Mr. Davidson and, and Ron Campbell, they gave me the ability to, to set it up the way I felt I needed to. And, and I didn't believe that I needed to have an assistant general manager right away because I had done that. I knew how to negotiate the contracts. I understood dealing with the league and the collective bargaining agreement. That stuff was in my bailiwick. I, I wanted somebody who had played the game and scouted the game, coached the game. So, you know, one of my first hires was Bill Barber. Yeah. I, I hired Great Bill guy. as the, yeah, exactly, yeah. as the director of player personnel and, uh, we had Rick Patterson was already on the staff at the time. Patter transitioned to become our chief pro scout. So those were the guys. And then, as as you know, working with a, a guy like John Tortorella, you know, Torts was a big sounding board for me. And and I would go to Torts and I would say, listen, I have an opportunity to pick up player X. What are your thoughts? And and Torts would, if he didn't know the player himself, he'd do his due diligence and so it, it was very much a collective process back then. Yeah, I, I want to get into torts with you, Jay. But I, I want to ask you, listen, uh, this guy, he made a couple shady trades in our fantasy this year. We don't need to get into that, Jay. But uh, <laughs> listen, I'm a pretty aggressive GM in fantasy. And, and all joking aside, I'm just curious, like, how often are you working the phones? Like, if I was minus three one night, are you like, you know what, I'm going to call and say, hey, listen, does anyone want O'Brien here, this guy? Like, or like, how, how often are you trying to get a, a pulse on the rest of the league? On, on a regular basis. It really is. It's something you do all the time. And and sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes it's just the, the phone call to one of your colleagues to say, what do you have going? How are things? You know, you you obviously follow what teams are doing. You, you see how teams are going. Uh, one of the things that I used to make it a point to do, honestly, and I did it every day, was that I would read, I would scour the out-of-town clips, Right. And, and not not to see what the final score was of a game or who scored the goals per se, but but looking in the notes, who who hasn't been playing in the last two weeks? Who who's banged up? Who uh, th those kinds of things to try to get some or who's pissed off at a coach? Who you know who's in the doghouse? Who who is not happy? And and just make the calls and find out where where guys are. And sometimes you could make a phone call and it would be two three months later before something materialized out of it. But but I always felt that it was important to know what the other guys are thinking. Now, wonder you traded for me twice. My name was in those notes my whole career, Jay. Doghouse, not playing. Coach doesn't – I mean, now yeah, we know why he got me twice because I was, I was always available. He was also watching the highlights, though, buddy. He liked the backhand sauce and you stick it up for teammates. And come on, you know. Yeah, you know what? And that's true, right? I, it's funny. I, I got to tell you, I do have a bone to pick with you, Obi. I'm, I'm looking at the website here for, for this show, for Mr. Curfew. You're, you're featured in a freaking Panthers jersey, right? Know, that's, that's the You're smiling with your Panthers jersey. And then I got Colorado, I got Anaheim, and I got Vancouver. Holy hell, I traded for you twice, Tampa and, and Calgary, and there's not you in, in one of those jerseys. You know what, Jay? That, that I'm going to put that on our social media guy, Mark Prince, who's a Flames fan. <laughs> yeah, so he still may be mad at both of us. He still may be mad at both of us because he's, he's a guy. <laughs> <our Flames> guy. <laughs> um. 
Jay, you mentioned John Tortorella, and you know when I first met you when I, when I got traded, I knew how like good good of a person you were, and then I met Torts, and I was kind of like, you know, it took me a second to get a read on this guy because he's intimidating. Uh, he made me a better person, a better hockey player, and a better man looking back. But just what was it about Torts? We all know the history of it now, but what was it about Torts that jumped out to you right away? Yeah, I you know it's uh, it's funny. I I went back to the American Hockey League days with Torts. Because Torts was the head coach in Rochester. The, the Rochester Americans, when I was the general manager in Hershey. So I, I knew who he was. I, I knew his shtick. I, I knew the success that he'd had with that team. You know, he, he won a, a Calder Cup there in, in Rochester. So when, when Rick Dudley, again, Duds was the one who had hired him. And, and I was fortunate back then because Duds involved me in all those interviews. Every every head coaching candidate that he had brought in when he was replacing Steve Lodzik, he he brought me into those. And 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 when he asked me what I thought about Torrance, I, I really did believe that John Tortorella was the right guy to coach this team at that time. Uh, as you know, having played for him, he, he is a guy that was born without the political correctness gene. Yeah. <laughs> he, he doesn't have it. He, right? He, yeah. there, there's no regulator on, on torts. He, he tells you exactly what he thinks. And, and he has the most incredible ability I've ever seen on somebody. And that is the ability to go nose to nose with you, right? Toe to toe, nose to nose. And, and, and have the, the most difficult conversation. And you give it back to him. And yet, when you walk out of his office, it's forgotten. Yeah, you know he he doesn't hold that grudge. He doesn't. He's not going to take it out on you as a player. And and I got to watch it through the years where you know a player would go in and challenge him and say, "I think you're wrong." And Torts Torts would always flip it back and say, "Then prove me wrong. Yeah. Then prove me wrong." And and he wouldn't just give the guy you know two or three minutes a game to to prove him wrong. You know, like a guy like Marty Saint Louis. When Marty said, "I can do more." I, you know, I, I can score in this league. I can be a, a highly productive player. Torts fed him the minutes and said, all right, it's it's your wedding or it's your funeral. You know, you, you think you can do it? Prove to me you can do it. And and that's it's one of the things that, that I love about the guy. And and people don't know that, you know, away from the ice, that, that he really is a, a kind-hearted, giving, caring kind of guy. If, if you're an, an animal or a kid – you have no problem with torts. Yeah. If if you're an adult, <laughs> yeah. well, it can go either way. Yeah. Right. If you're Brooksy from New York, you might not like torts, right? Because yeah, so exactly. <laughs> exactly. You can go either way. So, so Jay, after you know, just walking on the bus used to be after you, you know you get your butt kicked walking on the bus and you see the GM first on the left side and you see the head coach on the right side. You know, uh, I've been on buses where the GM's usually more pissed off than the coach, or the coach is like, you know, well, what would be your demeanor? You know, are you sitting talking to the coach? Are you pissed off more than him? What What was that dynamic like? Yeah, it. it uh, and I, I did. I, I took the losses hard, and I, and I would get very, very sour. But I, I always felt that one of my jobs was to make sure that I was there for him, as a, as a sounding board, because I didn't want to have him take it out on players or have to take it out on an assistant coach. You know, those those guys need to be together and unified and. And so that was always my role, that I wanted to be the one that when he was pissed off, he could talk to me and, and he could vent to me. And, and, and really, it was whether we were on the road or at home. I, I'd go into the coach's office after a game at home if we lost and close the door. And, and that was the time, you know, vent. And again, one of the great parts about John Tortorella, you know, I, I could walk in there or be on the bus with him after a game and, and he would, you know, he'd start complaining about a player. You know, damn Obi was was the, the dog's <laughs> breakfast tonight, right? And, and and I'd listen, and and then what would happen was, and again, whether it was at home or on the road, he would then watch the tape, and and the next morning when I'd see him, oftentimes he, you know what, Obi wasn't as bad as I thought, or conversely, he'd say, boy, I thought Marty was good tonight, and and I'd listen and just take it in. And, and then the next day he'd say, you know, and Marty wasn't quite as good as I thought, right? Yeah. So I, I always thought that was a great quality to have too, that in that moment, and that's what I wanted in that moment, I, I wanted him to be able to vent that to me and I could 
take it and absorb it and, and not react to it and then give him an opportunity to actually look at the film and see what he thought. Yeah, and it's a great question by Updog. And one thing I loved about you, Jay, is, is you wore your heart on your sleeve. And, and I was kind of like that throughout my career. Like when things were, you know, when we lost, I remember seeing you after games. I'm like, I, I don't even want to say hi to Jay. But I'll never forget when we won my first playoff game. We lost game one against Jersey. We came back and won game two at the old Prudential Arena. And you came down about five minutes after the game and came in the dressing room and were like, yeah, boys, what a, net, what a win. And I was like, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen, boys. Let's go. Yo, we're, we're going home. But you, when we did win, you enjoyed the wins very much yeah. as well, right? You, yeah, you were raw, you're a raw, raw guy. I, I did. And I, I truly, I, I did. My I wore my emotions on my sleeve. And, and, and you know what? I, I just, I, I was passionate about it. And, and as you know, I, I cared. I, I cared about not just the team and the wins and like I cared about the guys. Yeah, you did. And we cared about you right back, and that's why you won a Stanley Cup. But I want to ask you about a guy. Uh, when you brought me in, I only had him for from the deadline on, but but Craig Ramsey. Rammer meant a lot to me. Uh, I was sad to see him go my second year. You know, we brought in Sully, and, and Sully was fine with me. But Craig Ramsey, like, what did he mean to you? What does he mean to that organization? One thing I loved about Rammer, I was telling him. Yeah, I had Rammer too. Yeah, we get a big win. You know, you go out, give the goalie a little headbutt or a good win. By the time I came back in the dressing room in Tampa, Rammer already had a cold beard in his cup. It was <laughs> like, yeah. so I, I love Rammer. Yeah, I, I, I love Rammer too. And, and that's, you know, what a, what a tremendous coach, right? And, and honestly, I, I don't think people necessarily appreciate what a great uh, yin and yang it was with torts, right? Be, because – I would I would watch Torts and and you know this there there were times when Torts would just reduce a player to a puddle of you know goo right <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you just he, and 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 then he he'd skate away on the ice he'd skate away and here comes Uncle Craig yeah. here comes uh, Uncle Rammer and 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 you watch Rammer and it's it's almost like he's just he's reshaping and he's remolding and and he he has you know the quiet let let me tell you what the boy meant by that. Yeah. The boy didn't really mean it the way it sounded. The boy, you know, he'd say the boy didn't mean it that way. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I thought he just always had a great ability to be able to to help guys understand and see the big picture. And, you know, obviously he was an incredibly successful player. And and I, I just I think he's an awesome coach. I, yeah, I really yeah. do. Yeah, and they were a good fit, right? Because Torts would come in and, and, and give it to you, and then Rammer would be there. But I just remember Nick Tardaski, a guy we both we both loved, Tardo. Yeah. Poor Tardo, eh? Like, first shift, couldn't get the puck out. You know, next shift, couldn't get it. I'm like, oh, Tardo's done. Like, and then the Torch would come <laughs> down the bench and just let him have it. But uh, Rammer was always good at, you know, coming like in after you said and being like, hey, this is what he was saying. He didn't yeah. really. Yeah. You know, did you have that the same with him? Yeah, I, well, he was Kevin Deneen. I think he was Kevin Deneen's assistant. And Kevin was, at times, yeah. you know, our team would be up and down. You talk about yin and yang. Some days really good, other days not. And then... You need that voice. You need that voice. And, and that's, you know, you talk about relationships, uh, Feaster, with like some of your players. And I look back at my GMs and Paul Holmgren was a guy that treated like us, like his kids in Philly, right? Like we had a young right, team yeah. and, we, and we, we saw growth, you know, amongst our group, like from just from game one to say 82. And, and a lot of it is because, you know, the, the guy up top and the coach, they have this understanding of how these kids need to evolve and how to talk to each yep. kid and, and building those relationships. And the way he's always spoke about you is like, you treat these guys like the younger guys, like your kids, your draft yeah. picks. And yep. and it's so important to the, to the dynamic of, yeah. of a, watching a team grow. Yeah, and just to piggyback that, Updog teed me up. You know, when you did trade for me, you know, I, I came in, you guys were a few years removed from, from winning a Stanley Cup. And I, I knew of you and John Tortorella from watching you guys win your Stanley Cup. And... I didn't know anyone else in that dressing room. And Marty St. Louis, Vinny LeCavier, Dan Boyle, Brad Richards. I can't stress how good these guys were. Like, how good yeah. they were to young guys, how good that dressing room was. Like, how important are those four guys to you and what they mean and just how good a persons they were representing Yeah, the they, they, you're right. As, as great a hockey player as every one of them was, they, they're good guys, too. Yeah, that, yeah. That's how good they are as, as people. And, and we were fortunate, and again, and I give Duds the, the credit. You know, Duds was the one who he he convinced Dave Andrichuk to sign here with the Lightning, and, and he's the one who brought Tim Taylor in too. And you go back to our winning, and, and those two guys are instrumental. And, and you think about how young the guys you just mentioned were at the time, right, from, from Marty to, to Brad to Vinny 
uh, to Boiler. And, and those guys all got to observe, not, not just learn from in terms of what, you know, what Tails and Andrew Chuck had to say, but just watch how they conducted themselves, how they prepared, the things that they did. Watching Dave Anderchuk after a really tough loss, a demoralizing loss, when, when guys were sneaking into the medical room, walk into the medical room and say, get your ass back out of the locker room. We're all talking to the media tonight. You know, it, that, that sort of a thing. And, and they, they were. They were they were instrumental in helping to, to forge the, the culture. And, and then those guys taught it. They, they passed it on. And and you look at some of the like a, a guy like a stammer. Yeah. You know, Stammer Stammer was here and learned from guys like LeCavier and St. Louis. And 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 I think that's when as an organization you really start to have something, is when there is that kind of continuity and, and you are building and reinforcing that culture over time. Yeah, I just remember when I first got in the, I got traded in whatever I was practicing the next day. I saw Marty in, in his little get shorts and his and his legs. Hey, I'm oh like, oh my god, I'm like, like tree trees, yeah. like, yeah. I'm like, 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 tree, like I, redwoods. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not. Maybe I'm not doing enough squats in the offseason here. I'm like, what's what's Marty's secret? But I mean, Marty St. Louis to me, you know, and and listen, we couldn't have been more opposite guys. Marty was a great family man. I was a single young kid that I'm sure at times he looked at me and was like this kid's a disaster or whatever, but he meant so much to me looking back to Marty and I still yeah. stay in touch with him. And how proud are you to see him coaching and doing a great job yeah, with the it's Habs? it's awesome. It, it's absolutely awesome. And you know what? It doesn't surprise me Be, because, you know, one of the things Torts and I used to always talk about this, that if, if a player had the ability to self-evaluate honestly, right? Like honestly evaluate yourself, not, not, not kid yourself. Cause we all do that, right? We all, we all want to kid ourselves that we're doing better than we are, that we're giving more effort than we think. If, but if a player has that ability to honestly self-evaluate, they're worth their weight in gold. And Marty St. Louis had that ability in spades. Yeah, Mar Marty St. Louis never – like I, I don't ever remember a time where he and Torch would meet and, and Torch would ask him, well, how do you think you're playing? That Marty's self-evaluation wasn't dead bang on. And and so that's that's why I'm I'm not surprised that he is such a good coach, um, but you know Marty approached the game, and I always said this even after we'd won the cup, even after he was an MVP, even after he, you know the scoring all the all the accolades, I always felt that Marty was always waiting for somebody to tap him on the shoulder on the ice, and say you're going down today, kid. Yeah, you know that yeah. he yeah. he never he never got complacent with where he was. It was always I got to prove myself to stay here. Yeah, because he probably never forgot that feeling, right? No, I mean, totally. Yeah. And and I um, I played in the World Championships. I think it was 2008, and it was in Switzerland. And I had a chance to see the dynamic between a very young 18 year old Stamkos and Marty St. Louis over there, right, playing together, yeah. and Stammer and, and him on the same line, and just watching. Like you know, I remember even going golfing with them. I brought my brother Brent and Marty stammer and, and we're golfing in the middle of switzerland and and you know i'm just watching stammer kind of you know just follow his footsteps like kind of yep. the little things right like yeah. and it even started on like on the golf course or yeah. when they'd go eat together they ate together and yep. it, that's a cool dynamic to yep. see and you know something that you, you knew that natural leadership ability was in marty and now yeah. it's completely yeah. in stammer I mean, you look at the way stammer's yes. in Yep. Yeah, it's a great and, dynamic. And, sure. and the thing that Marty taught me and that I love, because I, I like to come to the rink and, and have a good time. And Mar no one liked to, when we were losing the, the second year, it was tough sometimes with Marty. But, I mean, he would joke around and laugh and play. And then when it came time yeah. to practice, he practiced as hard as he could. Yeah. And then he got his workout yeah. and did his work. But but he was always having a good time, enjoying the game. But when it's time to yeah. go, it was go time with, for Marty. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Jay, I want to talk to you about your Stanley Cup win you guys had. It was the best. I remember watching that final. Yeah. Like, that was that was men. That was men playing a men's game. There was hooking. There was cross-checking. There was fighting. Like, Gimla and, like, and yeah. Vinny. Like, just walk me through the ups and downs of that whole seven game. Because as, an, as a young kid watching, that was hockey. Yeah, it was. I, I, I totally agree with you there. And I, I really thought that... You know, going into it, the, the narrative was that it was going to be Calgary's will against Tampa skill. And and that was one of the things that I was so proud of our guys for that I, I really felt that our will showed through. Yeah. You know, I, I still remember Torts when when we were preparing for the final, right? We were at our practice rink in Brandon and, and getting ready. And he called the group together. And his comment was, he said, now that we got this far, 
why don't we go win the effing thing? <laughs> you know? and, and I mean, in a lot of ways, we, we thought we were playing with house money. I mean, no one expected us to be there. And, and, and it really was, it was a group that bought in. I always said that that, that team, that group, that the coaches, the trainer, everybody, you know, everybody did their job. And, and while everybody wanted to advance and succeed and, you know, like the, the, the AGM wants to be the GM, the, the assistant medical trainer wants to be the head trainer, the assistant coach, you know, Rammer would like to be a head coach, but nobody wanted the job of the guy ahead of them. You know, like it wasn't a case where Rammer wasn't trying to take Tort's job and the assistant equipment manager wasn't trying to, to take Ray Phil's job. And, and, and it was everybody just doing their, their job. And, the, the, the roller coaster of emotions was unbelievable because it did. It went seven games. And we're we're going back to Calgary and after we lose game five here, overtime, and, and they have an opportunity to win the, the cup on, on home ice, right? Yeah. And and I, I always thought that again, a great coaching job by Torts. Because, you know, he he turned the pressure and put it on them. That's that's when he met with our team when he kept telling the media. He kept saying to the media, there's no pressure on us. We're not even supposed to be here. Yeah. But imagine for them, imagine hockey night in Canada. Imagine skating the cup on your home ice. Yeah. And like he, he's doing all And I, I talked to Iggy when, when I was the GM in Calgary. And, and Jerome told me, he said, we bought into that. He said, like, we're, yeah. he, he said, I remember listening and going, yeah, yeah, think about that. Think, you know, think about how cool that would be. And, and it, it was just, uh, you know, Marty's goal in game six and, and double overtime to win it and send it back to Tampa. And and, and then, you know, Fedotenko, what yeah, he thanks. did in game seven. And, and, of course, I was pleased about that because that was one of the first trades that I had made. Yeah. And and at the time, everybody's going, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing? You're, you're trading such a high pick to get Ruslan Fedotenko. But, you know, I, I remember going to that draft where we acquired Feds. And Torts had said to me before I went, he said, if you come back here with a pick, he said, if you make that pick and that's what you come back with, he said, we're screwed. <laughs> you know, we, we needed players, right? We needed help. And so, that, sounds uh, like anyway, and, that sounds like Torts. That sounds like Torts. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. Uh, Jay, before we dive into Calgary here, one last thing about Tampa. Uh, you know, obviously we've talked about how you brought me in there and you gave me extension right when I got to town. And, um, you know, I felt like it was home for me. And then all of a sudden, you know, the course throughout my second year, there's rumblings about the team's going to be sold. And, uh, you know, no disrespect to Warren Cools and Len Barry, who I got to know both of them. But in all honesty, it was a complete gong show. And now sitting here as a 40-year-old man, I, I, I just wanted to ask you personally, like, you know, how, how was that to go through? And looking back on my career, I wish, Jay, that that would have never happened because I, I truly think yeah. I would have stayed there forever and we were building something again. But how was that or how tough was that to deal with? Well, you're, you're right. That was hard. Uh, you know, I, you, you and me both in terms of wishing it had never happened. It, uh, it, it was something that certainly, you know, we didn't see coming. We didn't know that it was going to happen. And, and, and it was, it was, well, you know, good, good old Torts, Torts, had, Torts called them the, the two cowboys, yeah. you know, that, that was his, the, yeah. the cowboys. Um, but, but it was hard. I, I, I was, uh, I had reached a point there where, uh, for a lot of reasons, I, I felt that by that time, John's message was starting to wear thin in the room. I, I thought there were some guys starting to tune him out and that we needed to make a change. And and I, I talked to Oren Coolis about that. And he, he kept telling me, put a pin in that, put a pin in that, put a pin in that. And, <laughs> and you know, and ultimately those guys had their own plan, right? They, they knew what they wanted to do. They knew that they were going to bring Brian Lawton in and, it was it was a really it was a hard time for me too yeah. and uh it was clear that i had no role to play i remember we were talking about free agency starting and and i was talking about the they had identified the players they wanted and and i talked about well you know i have a good relationship with this guy's age or that guy's age. I, I could talk to him well we'll get back to you now we'll get back to you that and, and and so it was pretty clear that the the writing was on the wall and and i was you know I, I was not part of it, and it was well, it was hard, yeah. Be, because yeah. I too felt that we could have turned things. We were going in a in a positive direction. Some of the things that I felt that could be done, but it wasn't to be. No, and we weren't that far away. I mean, I, I, our goal, our goalie Holmquist. What was his first name? Michael? Was it Michael Holmquist? We had. You remember back? In the day? Uh, no, was it, what was it? Was uh, it Holmquist? 
I thought it yeah. was. But anyways, he was a young Swedish goalie that we had, but I thought we had a good foundation. And I was just a young kid at the time. But once, you know, you yeah. left, the torch left, and they, you know, they brought in Barry Melrose. And I think Barry's a good guy. But, like, it just went from, like, structure of a, a championship organization to all of a sudden you get back there for training camp. It's like, what the hell's going on here now? Like, <laughs> you just realize, like, the, the, the stability that you guys had built was no longer yeah. there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Jay, so, so, you know, 2007 – um, I think was your last year in Tampa. There's a little bit of a, you know, you take a little bit of a break mentally. Like, how do you stay in the game when you, when you're a GM and, and you're shifting gears and, and, you know, you get released by Tampa Bay. Um, you know, you're staying involved in the game. You're still reading all the game notes. You're staying on top of your game. Um, you talk about that period and then, you know, what it's like to move into a completely different atmosphere, a Canadian GM, yeah. right? Like take yeah, it on a Canadian you know what? market. I was- I, I was fortunate in that once I was uh, once I was fired here, I I was able I, I worked with the guys at RinkNet, the the scouting uh, software program. I worked with those guys and I had my own uh, my own RinkNet scouting system set up on a computer, and and the guys here in the PR department, Billy Wicket and those guys were great, and and I was able to come here and and scout games at the arena. And, and at least have my own book on, on players. And, and so I did that. I also did some media work. I, I was writing a regular column at that time for the Hockey News. Uh, every once in a while I do, uh, you know, like trade deadline day at, at TSN, that sort of thing. So I, I was watching a lot of games and, and making sure that I was staying current on it. And then the, the opportunity came. I, I got a phone call in, uh, in spring of 2010 from Daryl Sutter and and he said uh how come you're you're not in the game how you know how come you're not doing anything and and I said well I'm you know I'm looking for an opportunity and he said well would you be willing to come back as an AGM and I said of course yeah I I would and so he he brought me out to Calgary and I interviewed with Daryl and the ownership group there and Ken King uh at the time the team president and 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 got that offer and so I was able to to start there at the beginning of the 2010-2011 season. What what I never expected was that literally, you know, by Christmas time, I, I started in, in July of 2010. By December of 2010, they fired Daryl <laughs> and and named me as the interim GM. So and and of course, you know, part of that was the dynamic between Daryl and Brent. Yeah. Brent was the head coach, and, and so it was that, that was a crazy time. And you're right. You go from a place like Tampa where it was exciting to see how the interest built over time and, you know, how it slowly started to become a hockey town. I mean, you know, you, you go to Calgary, and, and it's bigger than religion. Yeah. I, I, used to, I used to always say that, you know, I, I'd go to Mass on a Sunday afternoon or, or a Sunday morning or rather. And, and at mass, when they get to the part where, you know, peace be with you, and now let's share a sign of peace with each other. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't peace be with you. It was, <laughs> what the hell happened last night? <laughs> you know? So, well, peace be with you too. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's there's nothing like a Canadian market. I had that in Vancouver and then in Calgary with, but you you mentioned Billy Wicket. What a great guy Billy is. I saw him in Nashville a couple of years ago. Um, but listen, we got we got a question from our social media guru, um, Mark Prince. He wants to ask, uh, what was it like to trade Jerome again? Like, because we all know how much Iggy meant to that organization. So how was that as a Flames fan? He wants to know what it was like trading him. Uh, it was hard. It was hard, and you know it's a case where. At that point in time, the team the team had always been a cap team, right? The Murray Edwards as the chair of the ownership group. There, you know, there were five owners, but Murray was the leader of that group. The the team always spent to the salary cap. There was never any question about that. But as you know, you know, spending to the cap doesn't always guarantee that you're going to have success. And and unfortunately, the franchise was not having success. And and so. You know, you start to look at it and you start to look at contracts and you start to say, okay, Iggy's deal is coming up in a year. What, what, what are we, we're not going to be in a position where we can offer the kind of deal that he's going to expect that we, we need to acquire more pieces. And, and so it, it was, a, it was a difficult thing to do. It was a difficult conversation 
to have with ownership and say that we have to do something. And, and then you're dealing with a situation where, you know, he was really in control of, of where he would go. I mean, he had the, the no trade, no move. And so you, you need to get his, his sign on and buy in. And, and that limits your ability to deal with the marketplace, right? Yeah. Uh, if you go back and, and look at it at the time, we, we actually, I had a deal in place with Boston. And, and you know, I Peter Shirelli was the GM. We, we had an agreement. And, and, and I remember calling Donnie Meehan, who, who was Iggy's agent. And I said, you know, we have a deal in place. And I said, I need something in writing signed by Jerome that he's willing to waive to, to go to Boston. And, and I, I'll always remember Donnie said, well, you may have a deal, but we don't. <laughs> and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I said, I asked you if you needed an extension before – he would wave and you said no. And he said, no, he doesn't need an extension. He just, he, he wants to decide where he's going to go. Uh, and, and that was when he wanted to go to Pittsburgh. And so now, you know, now you, you're going back to Pittsburgh who you've said, no, I'm going in a different direction. And now you're going back. It's, it's a tough spot. Yeah, yeah, it is a tough, tough spot. I could have used that no move a couple times in my contract. <laughs> I should have, I should have had that one slid in there. This guy got, this guy got a no move somehow. Thank I'm still, God, I'm still I still wondering a, how he got that. Uh, thankfully, I'd have been out of the league in 2012. <laughs> Jay, I, I want to ask you from a personal level too. Like, you know, you win your cup, you go to Calgary, and, and I guess it was a rebuild. Like, what, what's it like? I've always wondered this. Like, what's it like trying to do a rebuild, right? Because we're all competitive guys. You're a Stanley Cup champion. We all know that the NHL is the greatest league in the world until you're losing. It sucks for the boss. It sucks for us. Like, yeah. how hard is it to try to rebuild a team, Jay? It's it's very hard, and it's you know the the tough part there in Calgary was, and I this is the honest to God's truth. When I went there as as Daryl's assistant in that 2010-11 season, I I honestly believe that our our path was going to be that we were going to win a Stanley Cup. And, and I, I always looked at, you know, again, I didn't want Daryl's job. I, I wanted to become GM in the league again, but I wanted to do it after having had success as an AGM there and winning a Stanley Cup with him as the general manager and, and then get my opportunity again. And, and, and so that was, the, that was another tough part was that I, I looked at the pieces that we had. And, and as you guys know, I mean, you get older, right? The players get older and, and guys slow down and their games – chip down even if it's just a little bit and 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 unfortunately that's that's what happened i mean we we had all-star players there we had great players and 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 yet it was you know the, the window it was closing and had kind of closed and 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 when you have to try to start over again it's it's very very difficult it, it really is it's and and just as here like you go back and look here after we won the cup, and 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 obviously we had Nikolai Habibulin as our our cup winning goalie, you know you look at Kippersoft there, yeah. and and I certainly felt as though here I had never solved the goaltending issue. I mean we you know we had lots of good guys and and they were they were good guys and 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 they worked hard, but we never we never replicated that. Yeah. And and the same thing was true in terms of you don't you don't easily find a, another Kipper. Yeah, yeah I, I know Kipper retired the year before you brought me into Calgary, and I, I just heard so many great stories from from the boys. And I was like, a couple nights, I'm like, I wish Kipper was back there to fill me <laughs> out a little bit here. <laughs> like, where's, yeah, Kip, where's exactly. Kipper when I need him? But Jay, last one for me, fella. Um, you know, I love you. You brought me in twice, and and it obviously didn't go the way we both wanted it to in Calgary, but. I'll never forget, like, when they brought Berkey in, and I love Berkey. I think Berkey's a good Irishman, but I just felt so bad for you because, like, I, the kind of – I think you even said to me one day in your office, the writing's on the wall for me, Obes, and unfortunately when the writing was on the wall for you, that meant the writing was on the wall for me as well, Jay. When, see, wherever you left, I was done too, but how hard was that, fella? It was hard for me looking back. It was kind of the end for me, but, but looking back to that, how – I guess another personal question for me, how tough was it dealing with that? It was brutal. It, it was absolutely brutal. You know what? And it's funny, Obi, because I, I remember like it was yesterday. I, I I recall that when I had driven into the to the saddle dome that day to go to work, the day that it went down, I, I saw Berkey's truck coming in, you know, behind me. Like I was walking into my office and I saw the truck coming into the parkade. And I thought, well, that's odd. I, I thought he was going to be out of town. You know, because he used to travel back to Toronto yeah. on the weekends. And I, I thought, that, that's, huh, I wonder what's going on. And and it wasn't long after that uh, 
he he called and he said, uh, "Hey, can you come see me in my office?" And and I I truly I was in fact no he he came to my office he he came to my office and I do remember he came to my office and and closed the door and he sat down and he said, uh, "You know, talking ownership, they want to make a change, and you know, you're out." <laughs> You know, Berkey, you know, yeah, he does his, know he does the sugar coat it. Yeah. And, and I had had a clause in my contract that if, if they fired me before a certain period of time, they could take a reduction in my pay. And, and, and I said, what about that clause? And he said, well, I don't know. He said, that's, uh, that's Ken King. We'll have to answer that for you. And I remember standing up and I walked right by him. I left him. He, he was sitting in my office and I walked right by him. I left him and I walked down to Ken King because I wanted to get that issue dealt with. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing that happens then is, so I deal with Ken, I go back to my office. And and now, you know, obviously my my executive assistant knows about it and, and the staff knows about it. So you got that walk of shame back into your office. But remember, as, as you very well know, Obi, I had young kids, right? Yeah. You know, like by, by that point in time, my oldest two, they were out of school. But but my my daughter Libby, she was a senior in high school, and and then I had the two young boys, and and I remember that was my biggest concern. I, I said I have to get my wife on the line, and I have to tell her because I want her to go to school and get the kids. I don't want the kids hearing about it from yeah. some you know yeah. some yeah. jerk little kid going ah your dad ah yeah, yeah. you know and that. It is. It's it's hard. It it, it hurts. It's it's tough on the ego, yeah. and and it's it, it's a it's a tough feeling. It really is. Yeah, it, it was tough for all of us. Tough for me. I, I personally thought they should have made a coaching change more than the GM change. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you you've you been know. pretty vocal yeah, about like, that. Uh, but Jay's leaving. Are, are, is Bob going with him or not? Bob's not going. Are, are you sure? Well, let's keep Jay and send Bob, please. Uh, Jay's awesome, but. Um, uh, last but not least, Jay, first of all, thank you for everything you did yeah, for me throughout absolutely. my career, buddy. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is your role now with the Lightning? What is your day-to-day -day stuff looking like? What, what's the life like, Jay Feaster? Yeah, you know what? Now I'm a senior vice president of legal and business affairs. So I, I have the responsibility. We have a three-person legal department. That, uh, you know what? It's so different than, than a hockey team. I, I have two great young attorneys that, that work for me and, and they make me look good, right? It's uh, they, they really are outstanding. And I was fortunate when I came back here, as you know, I was on the community hockey side. I was first the executive director and then the VP of a community hockey development. And, and that was growing the game in the community. And we did some really good things that I'm very proud of over the eight plus years that I was doing that, but been doing this for the last three years and and really, uh, you know, all all aspects of uh, of the legal, uh, from the contracts that we sign with sponsors and and uh, advertisers, that sort of thing, to litigation for the building and, and the slip and falls, those things, the insurance for the the whole operation. It, it's uh, it, it takes me back to my roots because that's where I started, right? I, I I'm a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center in D.C. And I practiced law for two years before going to Hershey Entertainment, a resort company, and getting involved with the Bears. So it's it's sort of full cycle now, full circle. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, Jay, thank you so much for taking the time, buddy. Like I said, uh, you mean the world to me, fella. It's good to catch up. And, um, yeah, thank you for taking the time. It's my pleasure, Obi. It's great seeing you, being with you, and you too, Scotty.